Hey, uh, mentors, if you can help out any students you see that are just kind of uh, still trying to find their way, if you recognize them as part of your group, then go ahead and pull them in. Uh, also, uh, for those students walking in, we're sitting by our peer group, uh, so you need to find your mentor uh, or their corresponding sign with the meeting room and, and day and time. For the mentors, uh, it may not be possible for all of you to sit with your groups because of the sheer number of seats available in this room. So if one of you guys can stay with your mentor group and the other ones can either see if there's room uh, to sit in the back or just hang out in the lobby. Uh, we just want to make sure that all students have a place to sit. So uh, let's go ahead and get logged into SquareCap. So if you can get your pull your phones out. Okay, so SquareCap again is supposed to be free up until the 12th class day. When you first log into SquareCap, it may not show something until I activate the question. I need everybody to pay attention, please. It may not show that there's a question yet available until I open it up on this computer here. The second thing is, you need to go to our course. So when it pums, comes up and pulls up the home screen, you need to click that menu button up on the top right-hand corner, and then it should say, First Year Connection Seminar, and that's our course. That's how you respond to the questions. I know a lot of students came to me last week and said, my square cap's not working. We just didn't f choose our course because uh, you may be involved with different courses with square cap. So I'm going to go ahead and start the, ans uh, start the question. And remember, please be patient because there's 500 of you trying to submit a response over the Wi-Fi. So give it a little while. If it continues to time out after five minutes or so, then maybe refresh your browser. Maybe log out and log back in. And remember that you need to purchase the subscription if you haven't done so by next week. OK? So please put a reminder on your phone while you have it out to purchase SquareCap by next week. Because if you do not have the subscription by next week and we run our question and you can't submit a response, you'll be counted as absent. So please make sure you do that. So if you see the counter at the top, it looks like it's working. It's buffering, so we only have five responses recorded, about 120 or so in queue. So this is the way it works. You need to, if you, your response has not been received, you need to keep your phone open and keep trying it, even if we've started the, the presentation. Okay, so one last thing. I'm going to stay a little bit afterward for any questions. I've been getting a, a, a large amount of emails this week about some just random questions about the assignments, about the makeup assignment and the videos, about square cap, about peer mentor groups, all that stuff. So anybody who has questions about logistics for ULN, if you, after our presentation, if you can just come to this front area and I'll do a quick uh, Q&A for everybody after our formal presentation this evening. Okay, so I'm going to let that keep running in the background. It looks like it's working nicely. Normally, I'll close the question in about after five minutes or so. So just keep that in mind for future presentations. OK. Is everybody feeling, I know we had a long weekend, holiday weekend, but is everybody feeling like they're getting into the groove of UT? No, not at all? So this is part of the adjustment, the transition. You're going to have to start developing your work skills, your, um, your habits, organizational habits, time management habits. This is the time to make a change. You're now adults. You're a college student now. You're no longer a high school student. So you need to make those modifications. And that means your schedule. That means making decisions over what's priority or not. I've also been receiving some emails saying, I need to go do this, so I'm going to miss lecture. I'm like, well, is that your scholarship? Is, do they offer you a scholarship? So you need to start prioritizing what is important and what isn't. I still leave the choice to you. Again, you're adults. You need to make your own choices. But just know what the ramifications are. If you can't go to that study session, then maybe find another way to get that material. If you can't come here, it's got to be a legitimate reason why you're missing. So it doesn't affect your scholarship. So just keep that in mind, your decision-making process as you begin this UT experience. Faculty, administrators, and the staff are going to put a lot of it on you because this is time for you to develop and grow as an individual. And a lot of that process 
deals with decision making. So I want you to be mindful of that as you go along. To he tonight, to help you with that decision making process and why it's so important, uh, is our program director, Dr. Jennifer Smith. Um, we'd like to have her come up to you and s speak to you early so she can let you know as far as what we're looking for from you in this program, but also what we're trying to do for you. We have some values that we're centered around and some concepts that we want you to become aware of. And that's what most of this semester is going to be about. We're going to make you think about things a little bit differently and give you things that you can't receive or are not receiving it anywhere else. So I want you to be very attentive and respectful to her and what she has to say. Um, again, I'll have Q&A afterward for any logistical things. Uh, but to kick us off for our first leadership speaker series is Dr. Jennifer Smith. Good evening. Okay, one more time. Good evening. Oh, that is so much nicer. It is so wonderful to see all of you. We're going to jump into uh, this talk uh, really quickly tonight because um, I have a video that I'd like to share with you and then get your thoughts um, on that. And we're going to uh, cover a few different things, um, of starting with our why. As a leader, you will not go very far if you can't articulate your story. Nobody wants to follow someone that they can't relate to. And so that's why um, at different times throughout the year within the Leadership Speaker Series, you will have one of our team members presenting to you, but they're also going to share their journey with you as well. Um, many of you may look at me and go, okay, that's a white lady uh, who probably went to college, um, maybe didn't have many challenges. Um, you know, things like that. We all walk around campus, whether we think about it or not, um, and make evaluations about people all the time. Sometimes it's just with a quick glance. Sometimes you feel like you're being evaluated. Um, and that's tough. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit about that and uh, talk about learning how to articulate your why so that you as a leader um, can really empower and inspire people to do great work along with you, right? All right, um, just as we get started, anytime I do a talk or anytime we have a speaker up here, this is exactly the level of engagement I would like to see. The only time you should have your phone out really is if you're doing square cap, okay? Like all the speakers can see if y'all are doing this. And we always wonder what's so fascinating in your crotch, okay? Like, that's awkward, okay? So, we want you to make eye contact. If you sleep, we can see, <laughs> okay? Uh, so don't be that guy or that lady, what, what have you. You all look fabulous tonight as well. So let's keep going. Okay, we're gonna watch a TED Talk by Simon Sinek. And I'm gonna work on the lights here. All right. And this is where you typically get to laugh at Dr. Smith because I usually mess up something with electronics. Because it's a Mac. Okay, stay with me. While you're watching this, I want you to think about what sticks out to you. What can you take away? Nothing is watch, worth watching or investing your time in unless you're going to learn something, okay? So this is your job for the next uh, about 15 minutes uh, to watch this and think about what are my takeaways? Why would Dr. Smith have me review this, okay? Oh, hold on. Already doing it. We're going to do this, and then we're going to unmute the microphone. Here we go. How do you explain when others are able to achieve things that seem to defy all of the assumptions? First, Hold on. Why is Apple so innovative? Year after year after year after year, they're more innovative than. How do you explain? Sorry. This is why I don't do videos. How do you explain when things don't go as we assume? Or better, how do you explain 
when others are able to achieve things that seem to defy all of the assumptions. For example, why is Apple so innovative? Year after year after year after year, they're more innovative than all their competition. And yet, they're just a computer company. They're just like everyone else. They have the same access, the same talent, the same agency, the same consultant, the same media. Then why is it that they seem to have something different? Why is it that Martin Luther King led the civil rights movement? He wasn't the only man who suffered in pre civil rights America, and he certainly wasn't the only great orator of the day. Why him? And why is it that the Wright brothers were able to figure out control powered man flight? when there were certainly other teams who were better qualified, better funded, and they could. There's something else at play here. About three and a half years ago, I made a discovery. And this discovery profoundly changed my view on how I thought the world worked, and even profoundly changed the way in which I operated it. As it turns out, there's a pattern. As it turns out, all the great and inspiring leaders and organizations in the world, whether it's Apple or Martin Luther King or the Wright brothers, they will think, act, and communicate the exact same way, and it's the complete opposite to everyone else. All I did was codify it. And it's probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose, what's your cause, what's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed and way? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspired, or inspired organizations regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. So let me give you an example. I use Apple because you can understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Mm -hmm. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done, that's how most sales is done, and that's how most of us communicate as a person. We say what we do, we say how we're different or how we're better, and we expect some sort of behavior, or purchase a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers, the biggest clients, we have, you know, we always perform for our clients who do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage, it has you know leather seats, buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This explains why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from Apple. But we're also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from Apple, or a phone from Apple, or a DVR from Apple. But as I said before, Apple's just a computer company. There's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors. Their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products. In fact, they tried. A few years ago, Gateway came out with flat screen TVs. They're eminently qualified to make flat screen TVs. They've been making flat screen monitors for years. No, we bought one. And then, Dell came out with MP3 players and PDAs. 
and they make great quality products, and they can make perfectly well-designed products, and nobody bought one. In fact, talking about it now, we can't even imagine buying an MP3 player from Dell. Why would you buy an MP3 player from a computer company? But we do it every day. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. The goal is not to do business with anybody, with everybody who needs what you have. The goal is to do business with people who believe what you believe. Here's the best part. None of what I'm telling you is my opinion. It's all grounded in the tenets of biology, not psychology, biology. If you look at a cross-section of the human brain looking from the top down, what you see is the human brain is actually broken into three major components that correlate perfectly with the golden circle. Our newest brain, our homo sapien brain, our neocortex, corresponds with the what level. The neocortex is responsible for all our rational and analytical thought and language. The middle two sections make up our limbic brains, and our limbic brains are responsible for all of our feelings, like trust and loyalty. It's also responsible for all human behavior, all decision making, and it has no capacity for language. In other words, when we communicate from the outside in, yes, people can understand vast amounts of complicated information like features and benefits and facts and figures, just as about behavior. When we communicate from the inside out, we're talking directly to the part of the brain that controls behavior, and then we allow people to rationalize it with the tangible things we say and do. This is where gut decisions come from. You know, sometimes you can give somebody all the facts and the figures and you say, I know what all the facts and details say, but it just doesn't feel right. Why would we use that verb? It doesn't feel right. Because the part of the brain that controls decision making doesn't control language. And the best we can muster up is, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. Or sometimes you say you're reading with your heart, you're reading with your soul. Well, I hate to break it to you, there's no other body parts controlling your behavior. It's all happening here in your limbic brain. The part of the brain that controls decision making and not language. But if you don't know why you do what you do, and people respond to why you do what you do, then how are you going to get people to, 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 to vote for you or buy something from you, or more importantly, be loyal and want to be a part of what it is that you do? Again, the goal is not just to sell people who need what you have. The goal is to sell people who believe what you believe. The goal is not just to hire people who need a job. It's to hire people who believe what you believe. I always say that, you know, this, uh, if you, if you, if you um, hire people just because they can do a job and work for your money, but if you hire people who believe what you believe, they work for you with blood and sweat and tears. And nowhere, nowhere else is there a better example of this than with the Wright brothers. Most people don't know about Samuel Pierpont Langley. And back in the early 20th century, the pursuit of power man flight was like the dot com of the day. Everybody was trying it. And Samuel Pierpont Langley had what we assume to be the recipe for success. I mean, even now, you ask people, why did your product or why did your company fail? And people always give you the same permutation of the same three things. Undercapitalized, the wrong people, bad market conditions, it's always the same three things. So let's explore that. Samuel Pierpont Langley was given $50,000 by the War Department to figure out this flying machine. Money was no problem. He held a seat at Harvard and worked at the Smithsonian and was extremely well connected. He knew all the big minds of the day. He hired the best minds money could find and the market conditions were fantastic. The New York Times followed him around everywhere and everyone was rooting for Langley. But how can we never heard of Samuel Pierpont Langley? A few hundred miles away in Dayton, Ohio, Orville and Wilbur Wright, they had none of what we consider to be the recipe for success. They had no money. They paid for their dream with the proceeds from their bicycle shop. Not a single person on the Wright Brothers team had a college education, not even Oral or Wilbur. And the New York Times followed them around nowhere. The difference was Oral and Wilbur were driven by a cause, by a purpose, by a belief. They believed that if they could figure out this flying machine, it would change the course of the world. Samuel Pierpont Langley was different. He wanted to be rich, and he wanted to be famous. He was in pursuit of the result. He was in pursuit of the riches. And lo and behold, look what happened. The people who believed in the Wright Brothers' dream worked with them for, with blood and sweat and tears. The others just worked for the paycheck. And they tell stories of how every time the Wright Brothers went out, they would have to take five sets of parts because that's how many times they would crash before they came in for supper. 
And eventually, on December 17, 1903, the Wright brothers took flight. And no one was there to even experience it. We found out about it a few days later. And further proof that Langley was motivated by the wrong thing, the day the Wright brothers took flight, he quit. He could have said, that's an amazing discovery, guys, and I will improve upon your technology. But he didn't. He wasn't first. He didn't get rich. He didn't get famous. So he quit. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And if you talk about what you believe, you will attract those who believe what you believe. Well, why is it important to attract those who believe what you believe? Something called the law of diffusion and innovation. And if you don't know the law, you definitely know the terminology. The first Two and a half percent of our population are our innovators. The next 13 and a half percent of our population are our early adopters. The next 34 percent are your early majority, your late majority, and your laggards. The only reason these people buy touchstone phones is because you can't buy rotary phones anymore. <laughs> we all sit at various places at various times on the scale. What the law of diffusion of innovation tells us is that if you want mass market success or mass market acceptance of an idea, you cannot have it until you achieve this tipping point between 15 and 18% market penetration, and then the system tips. And I love asking businesses, what's your conversion on a new business? And they love to say, oh, it's about 10% probably. Well, you can trip over 10% of the customers. We all have about 10% who just get it. That's how we describe them, right? That's like that gut feeling, oh, they just get it. The problem is how do you find ones that just get it before you're doing business with them versus the ones who don't get it. So it's this here, this little gap, that you have to close, as Jeffrey Moore calls it, crossing the chasm. Because you see, the early majority will not try something until someone else has tried it first. And these guys, the innovators and the early adopters, they're comfortable making those gut decisions. They're more comfortable making those intuitive decisions that are driven by what they believe about the world and not just what product is available. These are the people who stood online for six hours to buy an iPhone when they first came out. And you could have just walked into the store the next week and bought one off the shelf. These are the people who spent $40,000 on flat screen TVs when they first came out, even though the technology was substandard. And by the way, they didn't do it because the technology was so great. They did it for themselves. It's because they wanted to be first. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And what you do simply proves what you believe. In fact, people will do the things that prove what they believe. The reason that person bought the iPhone on the first, in the first six hours, so in line for six hours, was because of what they believed about the world and how they wanted everybody to see them. They were first. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So let me give you a famous example, a famous failure and a famous success of the law of diffusion innovation. First, the famous failure. It's a commercial example. As we said before a second ago, the recipe for success is money and the right people and the right marketing conditions, right? You should have success then. Look at TiVo. From the time TiVo came out about eight or nine years ago to this current day, they are the single highest quality product on the market. Hands down, there is no dispute. They were extremely well funded. Market conditions were fantastic. I mean, we use TiVo as a verb. I TiVo stuff on my piece of junk time on a DVR all the time. But TiVo's commercial vendor, they never made money. And when they went IPO, their stock was at about $30 or $40 and it plummeted and it's never traded above 10. In fact, I don't think it's even about six, except for a couple of little spikes. But what you see, when Tivo launched their product, they told us all what they had. They said, we have a product that pauses live TV, skips commercials, rewinds live TV, and memorizes your viewing habits without you even asking. And the cynical majority said, we don't believe you. We don't need it. We don't like it. You're scaring us. What if they had said, if you're the kind of person who likes to have total control over every aspect of your life, boy, do we have a product for you. It pauses life to eat, skips commercials, memorizes your viewing habits, et cetera, et cetera. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it, and what you do simply serves as the proof of what you believe. Now let me give you a successful example of the law of diffusion innovation. In the summer of 1963, 
250,000 people showed up on the mall in Washington to hear Dr. King speak. They sent out no invitations, and there was no website to check the date. How do you do that? Well, Dr. King wasn't the only man in America who's the who's a great orator. He wasn't the only man in America who suffered in a pre-civil rights America. In fact, some of his ideas were bad. But he had a gift. He didn't go around telling people what needed to change America. He went around and told people what he believed. I believe, I believe, I believe, he told people. And people who believed what he believed took his cause and they made it their own. And they told people. And some of those people um, created structures to get the word out to even more people. And lo and behold, 250,000 people showed up on the right day, on the right time, to hear him speak. How many of them showed up for him? Zero. They showed up for themselves. It's what they believed about America that got them to travel on the bus for eight hours to stand in the sun in Washington for in the middle of August. It's what they believed. And it wasn't about black versus white. 25% of the audience was white. Dr. King believed that there are two types of laws in this world. Those that are made by a higher authority, authority and those that are made by man. And not until all the laws that are made by man are consistent with the laws that are made by the higher authority when we live in a just world. It just so happens that the civil rights movement was the perfect thing to help him bring his cause to life. We followed not him, not for him, but for ourselves. And by the way, he gave the I have a dream speech, not the I have a plan speech. We see the politicians now with their comprehensive twelve point plans that don't inspire anybody. Because there are leaders and there are those who lead. Leaders hold a position of power or authority, but those who lead inspire us. Whether they're individuals or organizations, we follow those who lead, not because we have to, but because we want to. We follow those who lead, not for them, but for ourselves. And it's those who start with why that have the ability to inspire those around them or find others who inspire them. Thank you very much. It's an epic fail every time. Okay. Let's get back to our presentation. Okay, and I need to see you. Let's see. Aha! There you are. Okay. Sorry, I know that's a little bit bright. All right, so talk to me a little bit. What stood out to you? This is where I'm looking for actual raising of hands and talking to me. Yes, ma'am. Be really loud. The why, the how, and the what, right? Really understanding why it is, what you're doing, and, and why that is so that you can explain that to others, knowing how you do those things, and inevitably, what it is that you're actually doing. Good, what else? Yes, sir, in the Oxford, yes, you. Oh, um, so that's me, like, you could tell he genuinely believed in what he himself was talking about. Right. Like, Absolutely, and he was really thorough about it too, right? He came really at it from an academic perspective. He had done his research in social science, in business, in the media. I was kind of hoping to grab a little bit of all of you. There were a lot of business references, but you can translate those and transfer those to many situations. Good. What about one more? Yes, ma'am. Yes, you. Yeah, he reals, used real life examples, not just this, well, you could imagine this, this could be beneficial. No, he, t he explained you know, what his theory was, in a sense, and then gave you examples of how it came to be in real life. All right, good. So why ULN? Why, what do you believe about being a ULN student? What is your purpose or your motivation, do you think, as being a part of this program? What's the why behind a ULN student? What do you think? Yes, sir. To become a professional. That is absolutely one. What else? Yes, sir. To set an example as a leader, develop as a leader. Yes, yes, ma'am. Absolutely. What do we want you to do in four years? 
Yes, graduate as young leaders and professionals. Absolutely, okay? So what do you do that makes you a ULN student? How are you gonna be making this come to life? How do you think? What are you gonna engage in? Yes? Community service in the back. Absolutely, yes ma'am. Experiential learning, internships, study abroad, all that. Yes, sir. You're going to engage in your studies. Yes. Engage and be successful. Yes. Yes, sir. In the back. Making connections. Right. This is the university leadership. That is correct. Okay. And there was one more in the back. Collaborate with others. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what is ULN? Just on the front. What is it? Does anybody think it's a scholarship program? Yes, yes, that's the what. Like that's the, it's, it's exciting, but it's not the most inspiring. That's not why I do what I do every day. Like I fight to make sure that money's there, but it's a function of getting you here to engage in this program, right? And to engage in all these opportunities. Okay, yeah, let's keep moving. Ooh, okay. Okay, so this is the why of ULN. This is actually the ULN mission statement, is to encourage and support students to graduate in four years and become leaders through professional and experiential learning opportunities that advance their education, communities, and lives, all right? When people ask you, why are you in ULN? I hope that you will start with your why and not, well, I'm getting a $20,000 scholarship. You think I'm kidding, <laughs> I'm not, okay? I know you're right here on the front doorstep of what your ULN experience is going to be. You're like, I don't even know if I'm all about ULN yet or not. But let me help you to really think about why we're here. And this is it, this is it. We're providing you with the scholarship, but that's just the vehicle to get you here. Does that make sense? It's just the car. It's a nice car, we like it. but. It's just the vehicle. It's not the, really the substance of your experience. We talked about this at orientation, but our three watchwords for ULN, the things that guide us, the things that you are going to become known for on this campus are for your authentic leadership, your professionalism, and your grit. Um, and I'm gonna talk with you a little bit tonight about my um, experience as a leader and some of the um, kind of trials and tribulations that I have gone through as a leader. Because I think oftentimes you'll look at your professors or your ULN staff and you're like, oh, you know, they just graduated college and then they became a professor and that was it. You know, it, it, may, be, it may look like we have it all together. And I want to make sure that you understand that we all travel a journey that isn't always visible. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, how many of you are in the TIF Scholars program? Yeah, look at that, that's a lot. Yay, natural sciences. Um, Dr. Harkins uh, directs the Texas Interdisciplinary Plan or TIF Scholars program, and I'm crediting her with this because I got to work with her for the last 10 years. Um, she gives a great example of a little red wagon. Everybody kind of recognize this? Um, she would talk to us about how